you could do this on a shoestring budget mm. you know with a simple tank don't yeah. some materials you could almost collect yourself or find in your average garden center yeah um, yeah, yeah. Doesn't I mean, even need pep, a... these pep all come from your garden. The big yeah, ones, yeah, they're yeah. all in the garden street. And the wood you can collect. And uh, you don't need a very, you don't need like a super expensive filter. No. Hi, Ty. Hi, George. We're here again. Once more. <laughs> the last, last time, do you reckon? Uh, who knows? What have we got here? We've got a display for Stiffodon gobies from Indo-Pacific region. Okay, cool. And um, why have we set this up today? There's one there. Because months and months ago, I set up a tank for the Stiffodon gobies and I photographed it and it yeah. just didn't come out that well. It didn't look that good. And so I asked you could we have another go and uh and luckily and the tank was empty again yeah and um we have and yeah they're they're, they're out of yeah, that now right yeah so it's been set up probably an hour about that yeah and we used um we'll talk about more by the way we do a step-by-step -step of this whole setup after this session we're just going to talk about a bit of backstory mm -hmm. a bit some context and talk about your book in a bit more detail. Yeah. Um, so yeah, watch the rest of the video for the step by step. If you don't, if you want to skip this rambling bit, then uh, fast forward to the timer, uh, the time code on the bottom of the screen right now. But this is an introduction for those that are interested in kind of habitat style aquascaping. A bit more about Ty's book, where we are with the progress with it so mm -hmm. far, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the the story behind this is. We, want, we need to do another setup. Luckily, this was spare. I've had such great fun doing it, and I think you will agree. We've both of us have sat behind the desk for mm. so long working on the book. Yeah, it's actually really great to literally get our hands wet again, exactly, and create something beautiful, um, and re kind of reconnect us with the reason why we do it. Yeah, you kind of get a bit lost in the. I mean, you're doing words, I'm doing photos, and you just. Yeah, tunnel vision sometimes. Yeah, so very much. It's yeah. great to be able to set something up beautiful. Before I forget, I want to thank Aquarium Gardens mm -hmm. for supplying pretty much all the materials inside the tank. And then we need to thank a load of people for all of the other bits and bobs. Maidenhead Aquatics, Scottsdale's, thanks to Max for learning us the gobies. Fish, yeah. And, um, and then all of the other suppliers yeah. that have helped with the whole book and, and everything that you see here from the tank to the everything the pipe work, pipe work lighting, lighting filter yeah, we'll leave links to all the suppliers and description so but thank you to everyone that's been involved mm. um what can we say what can we say that we haven't said in the vlog so far i guess we can talk about how simple it is to put yeah. something like this together so i wanted to do a stiffedon display um i've seen stiffedon in the philippines in in the highlands in luzon in the sort of mountain river habitat and then I reached out to my friend uh, Julia Bin who's a friend in Germany who's a real you know goby aficionado and check out her Instagram because she's got some great They're photos on there that now, she's yeah. also into like uh, epiphytic orchids and stuff so oh, she's, wow. yeah, she's got cool stuff going on yeah, yeah. Um, and she has seen Stiffedon in the wild in Indonesia in several habitats so we were kind of sending each other pictures of the habitats and talking about them and I thought hey we could do that in a relatively small tank we could do something really simple um, that yet yeah, looked natural mm. catered to the needs of the fish and that pretty much anyone could do and so I called you and said hey what do you think about having another go at the stiffen on display and, yeah and here and I'm, we really, are. I'm really pleased we did and it took us from start to finish probably less than an hour an hour or so yeah. and that's including taking studio quality photographs step by step yeah plus a film and a vlog and yeah it was just a flawless process very simple but very effective i mean it, I mean, it looks great doesn't it i even sent a photo to my wife and she loves it so that's well, good that's good that's the yeah <laughs> the uh mark of approval is, is important <laughs> the um we have a venturi system on the outlet the aqua rio pipe work which lets us put lots of oxygen into the into the tank have you got the tube? um we've turned it off for the moment because it makes it quite a bit of noise, noise yeah but <clears throat> we had it running we used a little bit of airline to extend the height of the snorkel on the Venturi. So normally you would see 
quite a lot of oxygen bubbles going in there and these stiffidon they they thrive in oxygen rich habitats and uh, oh there's one over here so yeah that's kind of noise so we've, we've taken it out for now so that you're not uh, bothered by the background noise but it does look cool it does look cool good for photos as well and um so they they, they enjoy oxygen rich habitats but they are also found in um near stagnant habitats this was the interesting thing i've always found them in, in these f flowing mountain rivers and in on really uh, large rocks in strong currents um, and then in slightly calmer shallow areas but julia sent me photos and told me her story of found, finding them in a, a stream that was entering the sea meters from the sea and the water was almost i mean much of it was stagnant it was over 31 degrees in temperature wow. no oxygen nation going on wow. um, but they looked amazing and they were grazing on all the algae and the alchwuchs and this is really important these fishes need um how to do you spell that, that sorry alchwuchs is a german word a u f w u c h s alchwuchs and it's it's a german word we've adopted which refers to the sort of uh, microflora, microfauna. Yeah, all the small plants and animals that colonize rock surfaces underwater. Lots of different fishes, like some of our plecos and loaches and gobies, rely on it. And uh, these gobies will starve unless they're given uh, a good supply. So I used stones that were in my garden stream. Uh, over time, they will go even more green with algae under the lighting, and we will supplement their diet with uh, algae tablets as well. This is why you often see these fish in shops. They look really starved because they're not being fed. They're not eating the food that goes in for the other fish. So it's really important to make sure that even when you add them to a new display, you've already got some rocks covered in algae. And uh, we've done that here. So, and straight away within what, five minutes of being released, they started grazing, Yeah. if, if even sooner, which is yeah. brilliant, uh, as you can see them here. So these are Stiphodon um, uh, Simoni and they are found from basically Indonesia, Moroccan Islands, across Northern Papua New Guinea, and up to the Solomon Islands. Oh, wow. So I'm calling this our Solomon Island Solomon. coastal stream. Okay. Uh, we've got some Acorus gram... gram variegatus. Gram, gram, which is often sold as an aquarium plant. It's not. It will eventually rot away if you submerge it completely. Mm. But it does grow, it can grow with its feet wet if you like. As long as the bulk of the leaves are above the surface, yeah, it will grow. Yeah, they're out here. They're so social, they sort of follow each other around and they're not very coloured up at the moment because they've just gone in. Are, they, are these nearly fully grown? They can get a little larger. So I think the biggest one you see there, he could grow a bit larger. Mm. Um, and they get this amazing electric blue stripe along the flanks and that comes round to the front of the face as well. Mm. Um, so we'll be able to show you some, some images of that. Yeah, try and get some close-ups. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's been great fun, mate. I've, I've missed scoping. I've not. Yeah. Done, I've not actually got. I know. I maintain my big tank here. I've got my cyclic tank, but you know, it's not actually the cre the creation process is what I love. And I love. I do actually love the editing of the photos. And I know you mm. love writing, but when you're just doing that every day in day out, yeah. it gets a bit monotonous. So I'm really grateful uh, for you today. No, thank to have you. This opportunity to create this beautiful little tank. I've never actually had um, a, a shallow tank in a mm. you know of in a deeper tank and i think it, i think it looks really interesting it obviously means the fish can't jump out these guys you say they can climb these guys can climb they've got those um ventral fins which are fused together to form like a cup like a suction cup on the they're belly actually climbing up the glass now they can climb up the glass they'll climb up waterfalls and this is how they can populate streams that other fishes can't access um, and part of it is because their life cycle they breed in fresh water and the larvae actually grow, uh, are swept down to the sea and grow in fully marine environments. Wow. And then they migrate back upstream as adults. So they need to be able to climb up waterfalls and over rapids. And um, they will happily climb out of your tank if you don't have a cover or you don't have the water level low down. Mm. So to avoid accident, uh, it's worth doing something like this. And I think it, it works pretty well. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the equipment quickly because yeah. it's quite interesting. We're running the Wio Slim LED. Yep. This is like a budget friendly but really high quality in my mind. This brings out fish colours really well. Really, and, really pla natural. and plants, it grows plants. And it's a very lightweight unit. 
Yeah. So it's it's nice. And we'll actually run this. I'll probably have this come in on at seven o'clock in the morning and then off at ten o'clock at night. And then that's going to encourage the algae growth on the rocks. You want this really long photo period so that we yeah. get the algae going. And we then actually they can, want the algae. And yeah. we're not, you know, we've not got any fully submerged aquatic plants. So we're not worried about them getting covered in algae. No. I'll need to clean the glass more frequently, probably. That's okay. Take long. <laughs> they're all over here. They're all over there. There's some, one of the joys about having a tank at this height and being able to I can look down on them here. Yeah. And you can see I'm watching them grazing. Yeah. And I'm watching the gobies here as I've seen Stiffodon in Philippines. In, in the like nature. Peering down into the in the stream yeah. and seeing them. It really gives you that it really it is really a natural feel. Because you've yeah. got the out of water, underwater. And in a, in a tall, you know, this is a relatively small tank, but it's the, the Wazi uh, scaper line. That's right, scaper 600, line 60. Yeah. 60. Yeah. Um, so it gives us that height. It's really nice opti white, so you've got lovely clear glass to look through. Yeah. Um, and we've got a relatively small body of water here, so we're massively over filtering it by using a large Wazi Biomaster Thermo 600, 600 yeah. canister filter. Yeah. And, you know, to reduce the footprint of equipment in the tank, we've got the Aqua Rio Perspex pipe work which is really nice we're using a light ground from the light ground and we've actually turned it off whilst we're filming this because it's super bright yeah just so you know just for the yeah for um, the exposure. but that really silhouettes the habitat really nicely yeah the pebbles and rocks are from my garden but then we've got the gravels from Weo Rio. and the Cimarron sand it's elderly gravel and Cimarron sand from Weo We've got our uh, manzanita wood. Yeah, from Came Dave. From, from Dave Gardens. Aquarium Gardens, as well with the Acorus plants. Yeah. We actually got in these by mistake. Yeah. So it was just, and I just spotted them randomly, and I thought, wow, they look nice. Because you were going to use hygrophila. To I think it was some kind of hygrophila. And then I showed you these, and actually they look more like the natural habitat. And this species comes from. It's also growing in Indonesia and in oh, the so Pacific it's region, so it's actually yeah. accurate. Okay, um, that's great. Well, no, and that, that's pretty much it for equipment. Yeah, I mean that's one of the joys of simple tank like this. Yeah, and over time the tank changes as the rocks get covered in in algae, which can either be green or it can be sort of rusty orange color. Mm. Um, you can see the tank mature. I think it's uh, you'll see your plants. You know, you could do this with a variety of plants that can have their feet in water. Yeah. Um, I guess the big thing is if you want to replicate this, is make sure you've got the right filter sort of yeah. fittings, isn't it? Because you might have to adapt. I mean, this is Aqua Rio. Yeah. But you could probably replicate something with Eheim or JBL. Just. I mean, yeah, quite quite easily. Even just if a hose going in, you could put a an air pump to generate the oxygen. Yeah. Um, but as, as Julia had pointed out, she's found them in habitats, really oxygen poor habitats, mm. in really hot conditions, they were thriving. Um, the oxygen is really important for the, the alpha to colonize the rocks, and that's what the fish feed on. So that's oh, okay. its main priority is yeah. down there, yeah. Look at the front now. They're actually coloring up, this one here is beautiful cheek. Getting a bit of blue. When they yeah. when they properly color up, they are one of the most stunning fish. Like the neon, I think the common name is co cobalt blue goby. Yeah, neon blue goby, cobalt, Blue, cobalt gobby, Sumatran blue goat. Ah, okay. What happens is a, several different species get imported. Yeah. And normally, like these were imported to the shop as Stiffodon elegans, okay. but they're not, they're Simone. Um, the species that I saw in Philippines were uh, orange with, and yellow and incredible. It took me three days to catch them with a little fishnet in this huge mountain river. And I just I stored them in a little Tupperware box. I was doing uh, anthropological field work with the Agta tribe, hunter-gatherer tribe there. Oh, wow. And they catch fish in the rivers with elastic bands and um, broken coat hanger, like a, a bow and arrow kind of situation. Really? Yeah, like a spear gun. Wow. And they made their own goggles. And so the current was just incredible. Like the day we arrived at the village, the, the rains, the torrential water, like if you'd fallen in, you would have drowned. Wow. Within a few days after the rains, the river level dropped. And the, the bottom was all covered in these boulders and stuff. But the current was super strong that I had to hold on to this great big rock not to be swept away. And then this elderly lady, well, elderly lady, but older lady from the village, mm. just emerged out of the water with a bucket full of different gobies and other fish that she'd caught. And she'd been swimming in there like it was nothing. And this is a tribe that, of, of pygmies. So not only are they, you know, <laughs> they're really small. And I felt really crap that, you know, I was being swept off my feet by this current. And she was like, yeah, whatever. I've also been fishing, yeah. spear fishing in the river. And uh, 
It was pretty amazing. So I'll send you some photos. Yeah, that see. sounds great, mate. Yeah, no, I'm so thrilled with it, and um, it's something that I wouldn't think of setting up myself. You know, mm. so I love this. I love this book project because it's so inspiring. Because I, you know, I'm a sort of diehard aquascaper. Mm -hmm. But I think what this project has kind of inspired me and taught me to do is actually think of the fish first, yeah, and then escape according to the fish's need. Actually, that's something a bit more, in my mind, almost more rewarding doing that because you know that you're giving the fish the best. Yeah. And, you know, and they are living entities in our care, and I think they deserve, we have responsibility to give them yeah. our best. I, I think you're completely right. And when we give them our best, they normally reward us with stronger colours, yeah. more relaxed behaviours, they'll engage in natural behaviours, yeah. and we get to see them thriving. Yeah. Um, so it's a sort of win win situation. Yeah. And, and you were saying earlier, we were talking about this tank and George was saying, oh, you know, this is, we've done it on a relatively high end budget. We've got expensive tank, we've got the backlighting, we've got serious filter. You could do this on a shoestring budget, mm. you know, with a simple tank, don't, yeah. some materials you could almost collect yourself or find in your average garden centre. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Doesn't I mean, even need pet, a, These birds all come from your garden, the big yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah, they're all in the garden stream. And the wood you can collect. And uh, you don't need a very, you don't need like a super expensive filter. No. One thing to point out is we've put our fish in pretty soon after setting up, but we've used mature water from George's amazing aquascape over there. And um, we had a mature filter, so. Yeah, uh, everything, so it's all like to temperature and literally just siphoned it straight in. Normally with these gobies, you never want to add them to a biologically immature tank. Yeah. They're quite sensitive to changing water parameters. Okay. Or, or poor water quality and they don't travel very well sometimes and often like I said they'll be quite skinny in the shops so it's worth seeing them feeding on algae tablets in the store before you take them home or if you do decide to take them home you know transport them and acclimatize them really gently monitor them and uh, make sure they've got stones covered in algae to graze on straight away mm -hmm. and you can do that even if you lived in a flat if you've got a, a Tupperware or a bucket yeah you can fill it with pebbles put it on a Sunday sunny windowsill There's or on a balcony some water, in there. water in there let them green up and then yeah. you can sort of cycle them uh, through as the gobies clean them up you take them out put them in the bucket replace them you have a constant supply that's a really that's a really top tip because um, you do find a lot of fish or almost you know, sensitive fish are almost starving aren't they in the shops yeah and it's because you know you have relatively sterile systems which is good for most fish but yeah. some fish need that live, that live and, food yeah. that we, they don't, that we're not getting. So if we can create that ourselves relatively easily, then that's yeah. great, isn't it? Oh. Um, Joe, for those that don't know, um, Ty is the author of Aquatic Habitats book, Inspired by Nature. Soon to be author. <laughs> soon soon to be published. author. We're, I'm, I'm the photo well, helping with the photography Director and, and general photography. marketing and stuff. Um, hopefully release this Christmas. Yeah, as if, if everything goes to plan, I'm working really, really hard um, writing the South America chapter at the moment, which is the biggest part. And um, hopefully it'll be ready for, for Christmas this year. Yeah, I hope so, mate. It'll be great when it is. And then we'll be doing, we'll be doing more stuff together and traveling around promoting the book. I'm sure people can hopefully- This will be in the book. signings yeah. and stuff like that. This yeah. will be in the book. So you get a sneak preview of what to expect. And there's videos of most of the setups as well. Quite a few. Um, it's proving to be a big piece of work yeah. and there's so much information out there yeah. um, trying to narrow it down and trying, you know, in total, we've now set up in total more than 96 displays. Yeah. We've picked the best kind of 55, 60 or so for the book. Yeah. It's going to be around 60 tanks in there. And um, that's a lot of information to write. And if you're doing, you know, it's at least a few couple of thousand words on each tank, I guess. Uh, before editing, it's averaging out between like five and seven thousand words wow. per tank, which is crazy. It's like half a million words. Yeah, Tara. which is, it's not going to be that big. But part of it is that, as well as the fish and the plants that we use in the display, I also offer alternative lists of species that you could use. Okay. So there's a little bit of information about each of those fish, and I try to talk about the history, both human and natural, of the environments that they come from, yeah. environmental threats that face their habitats and some general interest as well. And um, it also includes stories, anecdotes, and observations from people who are out there in these habitats. Oliver Lucanus, Ivan Mikolji, Julia Bin, um, lots of That's friends in Brazil. Point, 
Yeah, sorry? Russell Brian Tate. Russell Brian Tate and Thomas Minessi in, yeah. in Africa. I've got people in Mexico, I've got uh, people in New Guinea sending photos, information, data. So it's all going in the book. It's a real collaboration, isn't it? It's it's a... Not just in in people on the ground, but like even supplying products, you know, and helping us out with logistics. And I it's think really great. It's a lovely, a lovely experience and I really um, feel really privileged to be a part of it, mate. I'm glad you were part of it. I, mm. I've always said that this book is my love letter to the natural world. It's a tiny minute. <laughs> Can you carry on? But I also think <laughs> It's perhaps my love letter to the, the aquarium community. Yeah. You know, here are all these different voices and people coming together to produce something that can be hopefully valued and treasured by everyone. Yeah. And can make them better fish keepers and give their fish better lives. Yeah, and even on a deeper level, you know, actually thinking a bit more about why they're, why they're doing and You know, mm. not, not just what they're doing and how they're doing it, but why they're doing it. And some of the stories, I know the palm oil is a big one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you you can you only start to care about something if you're aware of it, aren't you? Yeah. And this book is going to make people more aware of these conservation issues. So I think that's really important as well. I hope it is informative. It has to be the BBC: educate, inform, and entertain. Yeah. And and that's what my book is aiming to do. Good. I like that. So I'll close it there, mate. Yeah. So, um, thanks for watching this part of the video. Now we'll go into the vlog of actually how we created this. Enjoy. Take care. Cheerio. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Yeah. Put it in the tank. Yeah, put it in the tank. Hi, everyone. George here. We're doing a new vlog. Um, just for a change, I'm with Ty Streetman, author of Aquatic Habitats book. And this is another step-by-step. -step. And we're just in the process of doing the ingredients photos mm. for the book. So, um, yeah, I've got the big camera here. I'm going to take step-by-step -step photos. We're actually going to do a setup for Stifford and Gobies. Yeah. Blue neon gobies. Blue neon gobies. So we've got them already to go in. We've got a mature filter. And so it's going to be an exciting vlog. Hope you enjoy it. Sorry about the flickering. Cheerio. Okay, so we've got our ingredients down here. We've got a couple of large boulders. We're only going to use this one here as the main piece and smaller ones here. Got loads more to choose from here. And we've got some Wio elderly gravel in here for more details. Underneath all of that, we've got the Cimarron. 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 Yeah. Simmer and sand, and then we're actually going to plant the acarus, which is a semi aquatic, uh, in some Oase scaper soil. The actual aquarium is going to be super shallow, so we're going to fill up to kind of a third, third of the way high, maybe, maybe even shallower. And it's going to simulate a very fast flowing kind of stream habitat for these beautiful gobies. I've got to uh, talk about the manzanita wood as well, and of course. Very special thanks to Dave from Aquarium Gardens for supplying all of this beautiful equipment. Okay, so this is the Wio Kimmeran sand, beautiful sand, really nice variety of textures, mm. ranging from a fine kind of sand, very fine grain, all the way up to like a two, three millimeter. Just looks really natural. And Ty is a Wio ambassador. I is am. Still working for Wio? Yeah, I do. Oh, really? Let's get a close up. It's really beautiful. I like. There's all these little bits of gravel and texture, and it's yeah. graded. It's much more natural than a like a monotone, yeah. singular grain. I really like getting your hands in there. A lot of people mm. use tools, don't they? But I actually like to get my hands dirty. Get it's like, for it. it reminds me of being a kid playing in the sun pit. It's very true. Yeah. It's very true. I think, there's a, I think there's a lot of, I think we've, we kind of miss out on that kind of joy as adults. We kind of think everything's got to be super clean and sterile. We've got to wear gloves, you've got mm. to do this. Everything's health and safety. But actually get your hands dirty and feel it and connect with it because it's part of, Exactly. It's part of what you're doing. It's part of you, really, because it's you know that's what creativity is. It's you creating part. You're, you're kind of imprinting your own almost DNA in, in that creation. So if you touch it, I think that's part of that connection. We're going to go all the way back. No, because we need to leave some space for, for the soil. Soil, yeah. Ready for the main rock? Yeah. Yeah, main rock. Just yeah. <clears throat> so this is now going to go all of thirds to the left slightly angled and then we've left an open portion to the back and that's where our soil is going to go and where we're going to plant in too. Mm -hmm. That's great. Photos right. on? Yeah. Just click the button. We're just putting some manzanita wood in. I'm actually going to try to wedge it in the 
between the stones because otherwise it's going to want to float. So we're trying to kind of mimic nature as well. So it's going to kind of creep over this main rock here. Basically in the, in the low water in the dry season, you would get bits of wood and stuff in their habitats. But in the wet season, when the water's much deeper and there's loads more flow, yeah. there wouldn't be any wood. It all gets washed away downstream. So I was talking with my friend Julia Bin, who is this German lady. She works with a fisheries institute there, and um, she keeps different on gobies. And she's been to their habitat in the in Indonesia. So between the advice and the photos of the habitat that she uh, showed me and told me, and my experience in Philippines, I've been able to put together something quite realistic. And I'm really grateful to her for. Uh, helping me out. We had a conversation the other day when she talked about her experience of seeing the gobies. That's nice. About their ecology. So, so thank you to Julia. Okay, so Ty's put in the chorus in now. We're taking another photo. This beautiful picture. So you've got this sort of arena space that's at the front where our gobies can hang out. Yeah. And um, the males, they like to perch up somewhere high and observe the territory. Oh, that so right? that's why this nice big flat rock is really good. Do you reckon that's where they hang out? Yeah, if the water level's just above it. Julia has explained to me that even in the Aquaria, they only really colour up and go into breeding conditions between October and January. Oh, okay. Uh, which is interesting. And so they've got this they kind of know, pre-programmed, know what yeah. season they're in. Even, it's hard. In, even in a, an artificial it condition. Seems, seems so. But it's hard to breed them because the larvae actually have a full marine stage. Because mm. these these guys, you know, they live up in rivers that flow down to the sea, right. in coastal regions. Yeah. You know, the eggs and the, the, the fry get washed down, and they spend the first part of their lives eating phytoplankton in the sea. Right. Before they travel back up river. Interesting. As adults. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, my no shrimp are similar, aren't they? they yeah. They're full marine to breed. Which is one of the issues. <clears throat> oh, that's really nice, Ty. Right. So, I hope the fish approve. Yeah, that's the test, isn't it? If the fish are happy. This is such an easy tank. There's no CO2. You use a tiny bit of plant soil. Um, if you use the, it's the quite porous. a low, yeah, quite a low, um, potentially low budget, really. I mean, you don't have to use a high-end tank, high yeah. lighting. And it's funny, the stiffodon a couple of years ago, they went through like a real price hike where they were like 18, 20 pounds each. Okay. Now they've come down, you know, you can get them for anything like 4 55 quid each. Okay, interesting. Um, and so they've become more affordable. And they were wild caught, I guess. Yeah, yeah. They have to be. I guess they're quite easy to catch because they're not very fast. They sort of tend to perch and you can grab. Well, that's little. what you think. <laughs> they are lightning fast. Oh, right. Yeah. When they want to put on a burst of steam. Okay, I can press them really. Uh, is that all the parts in there? Yeah. Are oh, you just doing some detail work with the gravel? Some gravel. Yeah. And then we're ready to put the water in. Okay, so now we're filling with water using my colander version two. And we just, how far are we going? Just let me know, mate, where we've got. We want that big rock to have about a centimetre or okay. two of water above it. So, like we say, we've got mature water from the Highline 400. Uh, approximately the right temperature, we've got a mature, big external canister filter for loads of flow. Uh, so the fish should be ready to go in almost straight away, shouldn't they? Yeah. We've got some mature kind of algae growing pebbles, so we've got a food source straight away. We've also got some algae wafers. I've just realised, Ty, that the water needs to be at least above the... In the Intake, bag. that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Bag. Yeah, so we're acclimatising the gobies now. We've moved the filter outlet to the rear right of the aquarium, so it's nicely hidden from the front. We've got our DIY Venturi sucking in air, obviously, really highly oxygenating the water. We've got this kind of nice slight tannin stain already to the water. That's from the, the water that was already in the filter from the previous setup. Ooh. Wood will slowly leach some tannins as well. Yeah, we want, we want the tannins, don't we? A yeah, it's a natural rain, effect. Rainforest environments. So we'll float them for about 20 minutes or so and start introducing just a little bit of water in. Yeah. I, some people dip the bag. I prefer to just start by putting drops in. Okay. Because when you dip them, often the fish zoom out. Right. And um, 
So they've been acclimatised, they're now out and about and literally five minutes later they they seem fairly confident already. Grazing on the rocks, trying to find their own little... So they hang out around together normally, Ty? They're quite, they're quite social, yeah, they're sort of little groups. I think it's normally a, a male and a you know, small herring of females. The males can be quite territorial. There's but, one um, pretty swimming at the back there. They're literally like five, ten minutes in and they're really... Yeah. Seem quite confident, don't they? They're a lovely fish. They're so characterful. Oh, what a lovely little system, I love it. It's the first time I've ever set a shallow tank up like this in, in, a, in a deeper tank. I think really? it works really well, yeah. I've done shallow tanks, but not shallow water in a deeper mm. tank. And it, it's really great because it means they can't jump out. Because these guys can climb. They can climb waterfalls and vertical rocks. And wow. It's one of the reasons they're so good at colonising habitats and dispersing. Because they can go where other fish can't. You can see the way he's stuck on the glass here. Oh, no. So they've got these ventral fins uh -huh. that have like over time fused together to form a sucker, a lot of like a lot of gobies and blennies, and that allows them to sort of stick onto surfaces. It also means they can stick onto rocks when there's loads and loads of flow that would, you know, sweep other fish away. That's amazing. What a beautiful little fish. I think this they kind of remind me of a land-based animal because they just obviously walk and hop. And yeah, yeah, and that's what makes them a bit different, I guess. They've got cute little faces as well. Yeah, they're characterful. It's nice. See them in the background there, so they went up against the light ground. I think they're stiffidon simoni. They came in as elegans, but elegans is very different, very rare. Okay. The other one that's normally traded is orchardians. <laughs> Right. But I think, and, and Julia thinks perhaps these are Simone. Simone, okay. But. Well, uh, thank you so much, Ty. It's been a, a pleasure working with you as always. And uh, we'll get some lunch now. Yeah. Cheerio, everyone. Thanks for watching. And uh, hit that like button, subscribe. If you haven't done so yet, and leave us a comment. What should we ask people? Are you going to buy Ty's book? Well, have they been inspired to set up a similar? Yeah. For gobies, you know, there's so many different gobies and loaches and stuff you could keep in this. Yeah. The, this kind of system. Rhinogobias, dardocarasins, all sorts of fish that love shallow flow, shallow, rich habitats. The only annoying thing is it is very noisy. Yeah. So if we take that out, it does obviously stop the noise, but you don't get as much oxygen, I guess. Yeah. That's, um... I'll leave it until the missus comes home. Cool. The, the uh, Aquario Venturis, you can adjust them yeah. so that um, they still allow oxygen without making too much noise. Okay, that's cool. Just like a nice compromise. Fiddling, yeah. So, not doing that here. Should be able to do that, yeah. I'm going to get the flow in there. It's good to get the ears yeah, blown upwards. Yeah. That's a bit better. Nice of, uh, surface movement, yeah. gases exchange. Yeah. Just means more oxygen gets in there. Yeah. Yeah, leave the lights on for sort of 15 hours a day to get a nice algae covering. Yeah, you can, and, and it'll all go very green. Like once these kind of tanks, they either go green or sort of orange, rusty algae. Uh -huh. And then it just looks really natural, really. Obvious. And the fish will graze on it constantly. Tommy, the fish are in the tank now, mate. You can't eat them. <laughs> He's always on the lookout for food. Mm -hmm. Tommy, what are you doing? Hey. What, no, I'm empty handed. <laughs> I'm empty handed. Oh, yeah. Good boy. Right, let's go get some lunch. Mm.